This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Why Is Everyone Yelling with Lindsay Hine. I'm your host, Lindsay, and I'm so grateful you are joining us today. Today's episode is episode 86, and my guest is licensed therapist Katie Kovacs. She specializes in individual counseling and psychotherapy for both adults and children. She's known for her work in high school athletics and the reality of anxiety, perfectionism, and eating disorders. Wow, I felt like I could have talked to Katie for three hours. We're definitely going to have her back on the show. In this podcast, we focus on transitions, anxiety, perfectionism, handling emotion. No emotion is a wrong emotion. And talking to our kids and ourselves about having a healthy relationship with our bodies and food. I always feel super fortunate that I get to have these conversations on the podcast because Katie is a wealth of knowledge as well as a very compassionate and understanding person. And it was a true gift. That's what it was. It was a gift to get to talk to her for an hour. So I hope you feel what I felt in this conversation when you listen back. Friends, if you are looking to get family pictures taken anytime soon or maternity pictures, graduation pictures, Christmas card pictures, I know it's early to think about that, but it's always fun to get those in the summer when you're tan. Check out Shoot Photography. They have locations in over 60 markets and you book your sitting fee free of charge. It's a 30 minute session and your photographer will meet you in a local hotspot in the area, like a pretty park. There's multiple locations in different cities and you can grab your pictures. You get them back within a day or two and then you can just choose which ones you love and purchase those. You just purchase the ones you love. And um, when you purchase five photos or more, you can use the code SANDYBOY and that will get you 15% off your order. So go to shoot, S-H-O-O-T-T dot com. See if they're in your area, book your free session. And then when you purchase five photos or more, you can use the code SANDYBOY for 15% off. Uh, This podcast is part of the Sandy Boy Productions podcast network. That's why we use that code. Uh, To learn more about the network and check out our other shows, go to sandyboyproductions.com. If you do love this episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Spotify and share it with your friends on social media. Friends, thanks for being here. Enjoy my conversation with Katie. All right. Well, Today on Why Is Everyone Yelling, we have Katie Kovacs on the show. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you so much for having me. Katie, I spent my morning with you. I listened to your husband's podcast. (gasps) That's awesome. Both. The one we did together? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you had a busy day. Well, I I went for a run and I listened to the first one and then I listened to the second one as I was like getting my kids ready for school and then driving around a little bit. So I'm fully, I'm fully immersed in your story. I love it. Thank you so much for listening. You know, what's so funny about that too is, um, he, I've never done a podcast before. And so for mental health month, we did that one together. Um, for your listeners, I should also say, My husband is a pastor of a church here in the Columbus, Ohio area. And so we decided that that would be a great platform for me to join him in ministry with um, just podcast for mental health month. And so we did two back to back. And then within that timing, your team reached out to me, Lindsay, to do this podcast. And I was like, oh, what are the chances? Here we go. So that's so good. We are breaking you in. Your husband broke you in first, though. So that's good. You you did a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, and thank you for listening. Yeah, I feel like I will really like his podcast, honestly. Um, Grew up in the Christian church and then um, have been all over reading all the books, right? Right now I'm reading, I've I've read all the Richard War books, but now I'm reading a book called Another Gospel by Alyssa Childers, maybe is her last name. I don't know. And it's trying Mm. to bring me back from the progressive Christianity thinking. So I'm like, Everything that you guys talked about, and this is just a side note for the audience, but everything you guys talked about, I was like, mm. ah, 
<laughs> like this is what I've been. I was literally just reading a chapter mm. in this book about heaven and hell. And then that's what you guys talked about. I was like, this is meant to be yeah. that I interview this woman today, even though we're not going to talk about those things. Right, right. Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that it resonated. It, it, you know, I'm sure this happens with you. It's been really fun since those podcasts came out, what pieces are resonating. Um, some people resonate with the, the faith piece and just what it looks like over the course of time to really um, interact with faith in a different way. Some people are resonating with the body image, eating disorder, disordered eating piece. Um, some people are resonating with just all other parts of my story as well. So it's been really great. So I'm glad that that, that felt connected for you as well. Well, and one yeah. more note on that. I recorded, I record monthly episodes on my Patreon page mm-hmm. with my husband and we've done a couple episodes on my regular feed together. And someone once said to me, they were like, how cool is that, that you have that conversation between the two of you mm. recorded? Like your grandkids could go back and listen to that even. And that's so cool. Sure, sure. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. Um, okay. That. So Katie, can you tell us a little bit about your background? And I know there's a whole big story to it, but what brought you to the work that you do with therapy? Yes, for sure. So I actually went to school in education. I thought I was going to be a teacher and um, went to school, got my bachelor's in Spanish education. And I was a high school Spanish teacher at a local high school here called Hilliard Davidson High School for two years. And honestly, I I loved just being with the kids. Um, I found out that some of the best parts of my day were just hanging out with them, talking with them about the stressors going on in the world. And as you know, there's a lot of stressors to high school kids um, and just really loved that. At the time, um, we were still under some political administration um, that was started by Bush and then continued by Clinton that teachers had to go back to school to get their master's degrees in order to stay licensed um, to be a highly qualified teacher. And so I went back to school to get my license. Um, I started in the school counseling program and just really loved it so much. Ended up um, switching to clinical counseling just so that I could go like go deeper, do more with kids, um, and sort of stepped away to the school environment, stepped away from the school environment and, and more into the clinical side of things. Um, of course that's one piece of the story. The other piece is I'm no different than, than a lot of people out there that, um, not only do I do it professionally, but I have my own personal mental health journey as well. And so, um, even that I had some really great therapists in my life that, um, really affected me in a positive way. And um, I was also motivated by, hey, I, I want to do for others what someone did for me. And um, that was another motivating factor there. And so those pieces coming together, I got my master's in clinical counseling and then have been doing um, counseling and therapy for people ever since. Um, I've worked with other professionals in their private practices. And then the funny story, when I was pregnant with my second child, um, I started my own practice. I know that sounds like, why would you do that? That's horrible, <laughs> horrible timing. Um, but starting my own practice gave me um, just a little more autonomy to be able to function in, in all the roles that I was playing at the time, you know, mom, but also clinician and wife and partner and everything else that was a part of my world. So, um, yeah, so it's kind of fun that, uh, my, I was pregnant when the doors opened and it's been 10 years this past March, we, we celebrated 10 years of COVAX counseling, um, officially up and running. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I, I totally resonate with that though. Sometimes I'm like, you think this should be my time of rest. I'm like having my, you know, I'm pregnant again. But sometimes I think that like doing something big and audacious, like gets us through those harder times. Sure. And it sounds, it, it kind of sounds more complicated than it, than it was for me. Honestly, my first baby, um, the transition into motherhood hit me hard and fast. And I was not prepared for it. And, um, the sleep deprivation and just, you know, just thinking about him all the time and trying to maintain my professional life at the same time was a very hard trans. I'm not great at transitions anyway. And that one just was like, Whoa, what just happened to my world? And so with baby number two, I was a lot more intentional of what I wanted it to look like and what I needed, what our family needed. And so starting the practice just, um, kind of was the way to solve that problem. And so, um, 
Yeah, it was definitely big. And, you know, uh, to your point, if I, looking back, if I knew what it was going to be, there's probably parts of me that would be like, nope, not doing that. That was a lot. And that was really stressful, but it's also been really cool. And um, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the business. I'm proud of the team, the ladies that I work with and the people that we get to serve. It's, it's awesome work for sure. I, we have to circle back to transitions. That's for sure something uh, I want to talk about today. That's a big one with kids. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh, and it, it it's a big one right now. I mean, the major thing that I'll say about transitions, it is definitely anxiety provoking. Mm. And then um, if you have a child that has any kind of neurodiversity, um, those transitions can be even harder. And so, you know, we have normal transitions um, here right now. A lot of parents are getting ready to transition their kiddos into the summertime, which, you know, we think of like, oh, summer, amazing. This is great. It's such a happy time. And yet for kids to go from a daily structure where every single day their routine is the same and they eat lunch at the same time to being spit into three months where there's wide open space that can be really challenging and really anxiety provoking. And so, um, those kinds of transitions, transitions into the weekend, transitions into Monday can be challenging. Um, and of course with this pandemic, I mean, so many transitions that we asked of kids, um, transition to virtual. Nope. Just kidding. We're going yeah. in person. Oh, we're going back to virtual. Oh, we're doing hybrid. Now you have to transition where half of your classmates will be at school. Oh, now the other half. Right. And so, Transitions have just been hard and um, they're unpredictable in some ways. And so, um, yeah, as parents, the way we can walk our kiddos through that, I think, is is really helpful to just say, hey, this might be challenging. Um, it's awesome. In some ways, we get to move into a different space, but um, it can be anxiety provoking nonetheless. And we'll take breaks and we'll honor what we're feeling and, um, you know, we'll move through it as best we can together. So, yeah, that can be a tricky one. So tricky. I was just thinking about yeah. that. Even this morning, we're like going on a little road trip back home and mm. I was like getting ready to pack everything and I could I could actually like feel myself, like mm. feel the anxiety stirring up in myself. Not that I'm like, I mean, I don't know if I'm anxious that I have to like pack all the things and just make sure the car is just right and all this, but like I could feel myself like <sighs> getting frustrated with my family knowing what the rest of the day is going to look like because yeah, of that transition. For sure. It's so stressful, isn't it? Like it feels like a full-time job just getting everybody packed up and ready to go. And again, it's a good transition, something you're excited to do with the whole family that can be really challenging and really stressful. Um, to your point, I actually experience it on the opposite end. Um, whenever we leave a family vacation, it's not uncommon for me. We'll get in the car to like head to the airport and I'll like put my sunglasses uh -huh. on and I'll be like a little tearful and stuff. And my husband's like, I know it's okay. And Aww. like those, you know, those transitions from like this really saturated family time, which like so connective and so special then to go back into our, our everyday grind. Sometimes that transition gets me for sure. But yeah, I think, you know, just to have compassion with ourselves of like, yeah, this is a lot. And even though it's good and even though we planned this, we wanted to do this, it doesn't mean it, it comes without challenges. You know what I struggle with when you say that this is a lot is like, um, with all the tragedy that ha is happening mm. in the world every day, you know, yesterday we just had this like horrific yeah. shooting in Texas and it's like mm. at the school and in everyday life when those like overwhelming feelings of like basic everyday life stressors stress me out, I really mm. struggle with like guilt of that. Like I shouldn't mm. be stressed out. Like my life is great. My life is mm. easy and the world is so heavy but mm. I think what I've heard from you and when I listened to you on your husband's podcast is like when you guys talked about how no emotion is a bad emotion, like we should embrace those emotions. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, I want to live joyfully. I want to be grateful, but like I'm allowed to also be stressed out. Yes, for sure. And what you said so so intuitively there is that more emotion can exist at one time, right? I can feel a sense of sadness or a feel a sense of guilt and also be grateful simultaneously. Yeah. And that those emotions, even though they seem opposite of one another, can simultaneously exist. And that that actually is um, a really mature way of handling handling our emotional life. Um, I think the other piece there that you're hitting on is. Um, 
you know, it does not help someone who's suffering worse per se. Sure. It does not help them if you invalidate your own pain, right? That um, just like we said, within you, multiple emotions can exist at once. Um, we can allow space for, okay, someone has a lot of suffering in their world today. Someone in this world today woke up without their baby mm. in, in his or her bed, right? And also I can honor that and honor the space that I'm in and whatever's going on for me, that we don't have to fall into that comparative suffering and invalidate our own just because someone else has it worse. And in fact, um, when we validate what's going on for us and when we approach our own selves with compassion and go, oh yeah, of course, of course, this is really hard. You're continuing to do your work week. You're transitioning this, the kids from ending school. It's a lot. I mean, we've got like tie dye and field day and you know all the all the things happening right now right um and you know okay yeah of course you're feeling stressed that's a lot and at the same time it's okay for this other person um to be hurting and and for you to really feel deeply for them too it's a different kind of pain but um both are allowed at at the same time don't yeah. you think social media has just like amplified comparative suffering? Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, one of the things um, I'll never forget, I actually heard on Dak Shepard, the okay. armchair expert podcast. I yeah. don't know if you ever listened to totally. him. Totally. He, um, he mentioned something. He's like an anthropologist anthropological kind of a guy. He uh -huh. likes to think that way, or maybe he even has like a bachelor's degree in anthropology, but he mentioned on one of the very early episodes that human beings are um, meant for community of 106 people. Hmm. And so, you know, if you think about without social media, that that the day-to-day -day interactions likely involve about 106 people. And so that our emotional world are sort of built for that amount of emotional taxing. Wow. And so when we're constantly exposed to, you know, what's going on in China, what's going on in Texas, what's going on in, you know, wherever that it's so much mm. and it's coming at us all the time. And then, um, probably to your point, comparative suffering is a way to try to be coping with that kind of, um, stimulation coming at us all the time. So it's interesting to think about things like that. That is fascinating and yeah. it's ringing a bell to me. I think I heard that and I remember thinking it was so significant when he said it because yes. it's so true. We just have these constant streams all the time. Yep. Yep. And, and, and even that, right. Our, when we're not built to handle that kind of stimulation, it does create this, this constant vibration, this amping up of our nervous system where we feel like we're living in a stressed state. And so it is really important to, you know, take breaks from social media, um, get outside, be in nature, be by water and engage those things that are going to help us relax our nervous system and get it back into a more mm -hmm. regulated and calm state like that. Yeah. Yeah. I literally, I was, did the, all the wrong things last night and I was like, ah. you know, looking at my Twitter feed with all the news and everything with the <sighs> shooting. And I was like, Lindsay, put that down. Mm. I, I was like kind of terrified I was going to dream about it, honestly. And sure. like, you know, like manifest it into my own life and my dreams. Mm. And I was like, I knew that I shouldn't be ingesting that. But then I felt like, but why not? Some people are actually living it right now, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, to your point, I don't know that it has to be all or nothing. I mean, we were doing that in, in my house as well. Um, we watched the, the beginning of the NBA game that happened between the Mavericks and the um, Warriors last night. And, of course, we were watching Steve Kerr's speech yes. that he gave as the press conference. And so we do the same thing. We want to know. We want to be informed. We want to know what's happening. But – we also have to know, okay, when do I need to stop? When do I need to put it down? You know, I've read what I need to read. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm done. And then, um, kind of let ourselves recover from that a little bit and then, and then consider, okay, what's my next step? How do I take action? How do I get involved in this? What can I do to actually make things better? Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Hey friends, a quick break here to share with you about a product I'm loving. Portland Bee Balm. Beyond the amazing quality of their balm, Portland Bee Balm is committed to creating sustainable products, which is hugely important to me. 
They are members of 1% for the Planet, which means they donate 1% of revenue to organizations tackling our planet's most pressing environmental issues. This is so cool. Products that are useful, natural, and add value to people's lives and the world. Portland Bee Balm provides the best hydration for your lips with clean and simple ingredients. Since I put balm on my lips multiple times throughout the day, it is very important to me that the products I'm using are clean and effective. Portland Bee Balm has so many different varieties of scents, but my favorite is the Organ Mint. The ingredients they source and the packaging they use all support health and well-being to the environment and community. So awesome. You all can go to portlandbeebalm.com and use the code SANDYBOY for 20% off your first order. All right, friends, back to the show. Um, Okay, let's transition to you a little bit. I just want to start with this big question. How did therapy change your life as a client? Yeah, I, um, I think that's a really, really great question, right? For me, therapy changed my life in that it was the first time I really had a relationship with someone that, um, I'll say was Mm non-striving or, um, it was someone who was really objective. She did not have any other place in my life. And so I got to go to her office and just be, um, I didn't have to, you know, achieve or perform or measure up in any way. It was just like, okay, there's no expectations of me here. There's no judgment. Um, I'm going to sit and I'm going to talk. And, um, you know, her job, she really offered me safety and security and empathy and validation. Um, and not without challenge. Of course, she would challenge certain thoughts that I had. She would ask me to meet certain goals or behaviors, but it felt so safe and um, that's really what we strive to do here, too, in, in the work in counseling is um, to, to make people feel safe. Um, let me create nuance there. There's a difference between safety and discomfort, right? Mm-hmm. So therapy definitely involves getting uncomfortable, um, letting ourselves be vulnerable, tolerating uncomfortable emotions. Um, but to do that in a safe way, um, is really important. And that's mostly what it was for me. Um, you know, someone to just, um, listen and encourage and elevate my voice. Um, someone to, um, help me tease through what I was thinking, someone to help me reconnect with my body. So, um, for the listeners out there that haven't already listened to the podcast, like Lindsay, um, I struggled with an eating disorder, anorexia nervosa when I was young and, and part of an eating disorder is a complete disconnect from your body. And so, um, that was partially what was happening there too, is that, um, she helped me safely reconnect with my body, um, and understand what I was feeling, what I was thinking, um, how to make sense of it all and really heal from some harsh, uh, circumstances that I had had in my life at the time. So hopefully that answers your question, um, in a high level of, of what therapy did for me. Yeah. Um, can you share with the listeners when you decided to transition to being a clinician, what the person said to you? Like, do you, do you know what I'm talking about when they encouraged you to do it? Oh, yes. Yes. So I had already shared, I started out as a school counselor um, and, you know, it was taking like learning disabilities and, um, you know, things that you would kind of encounter in a school environment. And it dawned on me like, oh my gosh, I love this program so much, but I want to take abnormal psychology. I want to take diagnosis. I want to take treatment. I want to take all these other classes that I don't get to if I'm not in a clinical track. And so um, I was at the University of Dayton here and I went to my advisor and I couldn't even tell you his name. He was the sweetest man and really wise. And I said, hey, I would like to switch my major from school counseling to clinical counseling. And he said, okay, well, um, anytime we're making a big change in our lives, I would challenge you to make sure that you're running towards something, not away from something. And so is that true for you in making this switch? And so when I explained like, yes, here's why, like, 
I want to be able to do this and this and this and this and this. And he was like, okay, great. It sounds like you are running towards something. Um, and he said, you know, I'll sign your paper and you can officially switch your major. But um, yeah, I shared that on the previous podcast and it definitely stuck with me. I cannot tell you, Lindsay, how many times that has come up. Just like anytime I'm faced with this decision, like, oh my gosh, okay, what's motivating this here? Like, am I running towards something? Am I running away from something? Is there a little bit of both? Sometimes there is. Sometimes it's not completely black and white. Mm -hmm. And um, yet we need to make sure that we're pursuing something um, versus just running from from circumstances that we don't like. That one's really interesting, especially um, for me and then others, of course, that might be listening. When when I'm someone who has recovered from anorexia nervosa, um, the brain the brain neurology for anorexia is risk avoidant um, versus like a bulimia presentation would be more like a pleasure seeking neurology. And so um, I have to really keep that in check, honestly, of like, oh, am I just am I just mitigating risk or am I trying to get out of a situation that's too scary for me? And can I learn to run towards things that are pleasurable? So some people might have to take the opposite approach a little bit like, okay, do I need to run towards stability and, you know, that thing. And, and so it kind of works a little bit different for everybody, but it is a really great rule of thumb. Make sure you're running towards something, not away from something. Yeah. I heard you say that and I was like, I have to, ha she has to say that on this podcast. Like yeah. it's yes. such a good, it's such a good thought. Like it's such a good way to assess what your next move might be in life. Yes. Yes, for sure. And honestly, that is, that is something that I I always think about is that, of course, like my master's program in counseling, you go to school to learn how to be a therapist and you learn the modalities and you learn the ethics and you learn all these things. But there was such a huge part of it that was so therapeutic in and of itself. And so moments like that where I'm like, these professors are like brain ninjas that just like know exactly what to say in the moment. I'm like, oh my gosh. And that that was so helpful. So um, really, really talented and skilled people that uh, I got to learn from and you know, it was a, it was a great moment for sure. So I feel like we're in a time in the world and in, in our lives where we mm. know not to talk about dieting and losing mm. weight and things like that to our children. Yet yeah. it still happens. Like people are still using language with their kids and I probably slip up and say things I shouldn't say mm. sometimes too. Mm -hmm. But can we get into a conversation about uh, good ways, healthy ways to communicate, um, taking care of our bodies and food and movement with our kids? Absolutely. Um, you know, I want to honor what you just said because I think a big part of that comment of like, okay, we know this, it's common knowledge. Like, you know, we need to be working on our body image. We need to be anti-diet. We need to keep away from like super, um, intense or, or all or nothing behaviors. Like we know this intellectually, but why do we keep falling into that pattern? And I think a major reason is co-opting. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with mm -hmm. that term, but this idea that, um, companies, companies in our world that make billions of dollars selling these products to us, they will use language like, oh, it's not a diet or, oh yeah, it's, it's intuitive, right? So they know the kind of like buzzword language. Mm -hmm. And so they will repackage a diet with those words and present it to us. And so we think that we're getting something that's sound and grounded and healthy. But if you just peel back the facade, you go, oh, it's, it's the same old shtick, right? And so I think um, that's something we have to be really careful of to not fall into the trap of co-opting and really look at, okay, what is this actually promoting regardless of how it's packaged? Um, but yeah, let's, I mean, let's dive into that a little bit. I think, um, it is really tricky, isn't it? It's really, yeah. really tricky. I know. I think the most encouraging thing I can share is that um, as parents to be effective at teaching our kiddos, you know, um, a proper relationship with their body, um, healthy eating habits, healthy movement habits, how to take care of themselves. We actually don't have to be perfect at it. We don't. 
we just have to be engaged in the process and doing the work. Um, we also can actually give them a great gift that um, we can kind of say, hey, yeah, I'm going to make mistakes here too. And so if you hear mom say something, like call me out, we'll mm -hmm. talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. And so giving our kids permission to be critical thinkers about it, to say, hey, mom, you're always talking about, you know, oh, I need to eat, I need to nourish my body, but like, I saw your lunch bag. You didn't eat your food yesterday at lunch. What's going on? And that they have permission to do that with us too. And like, yeah, you know, yesterday I got really busy at work and I didn't get a chance. And you're right. That's something I really need to be intentional about doing. And so that it's an open conversation for them to have with us. And it also says, yeah, I'm a human being. And it's, it's a challenge in the world too, to, to do that in the way we know we need to, and that, that our body needs to. Um, I think though that said, I mean, we don't have to be perfect at it. And the number one most helpful thing for our kids is that we are doing that work around body image and having a good relationship with food and having a good relationship with our body. Um, that the research shows that when we are engaged in doing that work, um, that we're going to really you know, give that to our children as well. Um, the research shows that it's, it's within same sex relationships. So mm -hmm. for us moms that, um, we're most effective in handing, you know, when we're doing body image work and we have that proper relationship with our own bodies, that that's what we hand off to our daughters. And then same for fathers that, you know, when they're doing their body image work, um, that's more so what they can then hand off to their sons and that, um, the same sex parent has a lot of influence there and, in, and in how kids feel about their bodies and what they learn about, um, you know, being in a body in the world. So I think that's pretty cool. I love to, um, Dr. Hillary McBride is one of my major, major influencers. And she, um, she's a clinician in the eating disorder community in British Columbia, Canada. And she talks a lot about the ladder analogy that, um, you know, most parents, we want our ceiling to be the, our children's floor. And so, you know, in terms of body image and, and food relationship, um, that if we're providing them a ladder, that, you know, they can climb up higher than, than where we land. Mm -hmm. And so with every passing generation, a little more, a little more, a little more, um, comfort with, with bodies, um, in that way. So I think that's pretty cool too, right. That the goal is not to be, you know, arrived in any way that like, Oh, I love my body all the time. Um, but just to be engaged in the work and, and passing, passing a, a, better space to our children than maybe what we stepped into ourselves. So it's pretty cool. Um, you know, it's a lot though. And I think social media, I mean, to your point on that before social media can kind of cloud that a little bit where right now, if you get on social media, um, you know, you'll see a lot of po body positivity messages. Mm -hmm. And so we went from kind of a world where it was normalized to hate the body or dislike the body or criticize the flaws, perceived flaws of the body to now like, oh, we're living in a world where we're supposed to be like, oh, I love my body. And that too is, is not always realistic, not necessarily, um, what we're going to feel towards our body all the time. And so, um, you know, I think that feels like pressure a lot, whereas, um, you know, more so in the eating disorder community, we talk about, okay, if that feels too daunting, how about just body respect, right? What can you do to respect your body today? Um, even if you don't love it, even if you don't feel great about your body, how can you respect it? Um, and that goes for us as parents, it goes for kids too. Um, and then maybe, um, another thing to consider is body neutrality of like, Hey, is it possible to be in your body and not be thinking about how it looks, right? Cause in a lot of ways, body positivity, just like body hatred is very much still focused on the body as an object and it's still very appearance based. And so body neutrality of like, Hey, let's think about other ways of relating to your body. How does it function? How does it feel? Um, what does it allow you to do today? Did you have any really great, cool experiences in your body? How did you learn something about yourself based on what your body was able to do in the world today? And so kind of helping kids see that they're more than um, just their their identity of being a body. Um, this is so hard too, especially with things like Instagram, right? When we're almost training our brain 
that our identity is appearance alone. And so um, the other piece of that conversation is teaching our kids media literacy that, hey, what you see, the photos that you see are not necessarily reality. And, um, you know, for boys looking at, hey, yeah, you love Wolverine, don't you? Like, don't you know that Hugh Jackman had to spend a year of his life trying to get his body to look that way. And that was like his full-time job. And, you know, we don't really, that's not where we're at. We don't really do that, right? Or some of these other Marvel characters that um, had to take, you know, supplements and work with trainers and do all kinds of things to make themselves look that way. And that's not necessarily realistic for for us. Um, And then similar with girls too, like, um, what they're seeing that a lot of it is filtered or, um, photoshopped or, you know, somehow angles are a certain way or clothing size, you know, you can kind of manipulate photos to look a certain way. And so really teaching media literacy to our kids too, to help body image stuff. Hey everybody. I want to take a quick break and tell you about this lash therapy that I've been using for a year now on my eyelashes. I cannot believe the difference that it has made. This is by Hello Skincare, and the Lash Therapy is a deep conditioning lash serum, which uses a unique blend of peptides, vegan stem cells, vitamins, and amino acids to fortify and amplify the appearance of lash length and fullness. So I'm going to be honest, when I first tried this, I did not think it was going to make a big difference. And now I can't imagine my eyelashes without it. I really can't believe I wasn't using it before. It says expect flutter worthy lashes in 60 days. I would say within 20 days, I noticed a difference though, to be honest. They also have great serums for your skin. They have a C Juvenate Super Serum. Uh, That's what I put on my face in the morning before my moisturizer. It's a vitamin C serum. And then they have a nighttime serum. It's an age-defying super serum as well that I wear that at bedtime. So you all can go to helloskincare.com. And when you check out any of their products, you can use the code LindsayH20 for 20% off your first order. If I were going to start with anything, I would for sure do the lash therapy. It is legit. So that's helloskincare.com. Use the code Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y-H-2-0 for 20% off your first order. All right, friends, back to the show. Um, okay, so one of the topics I wanted to hit on, which I found this really interesting when I posted in my Facebook group that I was going to be talking to you and seeing if anybody had questions. Mm. I had like a couple of parents ask about body image questions for themselves. And my frame of mm. thought was like, I was thinking like all kid talk, but I think this is really important. Mm. And I really liked what you were saying about the body positivity thing. Like, is that always a good thing? And Mm. I thought back and there's this one post I made on social media a while ago that it was basically, I was just talking about like, I don't feel good in my body right now. Mm. And Mm -hmm. like, that's okay. Because uh-huh. I feel like we're, we've been trained to be like, embrace it, you know, like embrace where you are. And it's like, but I don't feel good right now. Like, I don't want to mm-hmm. feel like this. And it was re- very well received. Like there were so many people that were like, I get it, you know. Uh-huh. Um, and so I'm just going to go to this question that's kind of rem- reminds me of how I was feeling at that time. Um, okay. So this question is how to adjust expectations and mindset as you get older and hormones change at all. (laughs) Mm. Oh, those damn hormones. (laughs) Yeah. So this is a great question. Um, especially for women, consider that during the lifespan of being a woman, we go through three major body transitions. Um, some of us do anyway, um, the transition of puberty, right? So, you know, hormones, like you said, and, you know, becoming kind of in a woman body. Um, and then of course, if, if a woman chooses the transition of pregnancy and again, that body shift, right. Of, of having 
you know, ha- having changes happen. And again, those hormones. And then the third transition of menopause, right? And having that transition happen there too, um, where again, the hormones shift. Now, for people that have gone through eating disorder recovery, that's another major body transition that they have to go through, where again, their hormones are affected and their body changes. And so each of these transitions um, involve a level, a level of pain, honestly, right? Like mm-hmm. we think about puberty, we think about pregnancy, like, yes, it's glorious. And we're like, oh, yay, you started your period. Or like, oh, my gosh, look at you. You have a little belly. Or like, oh, my gosh, well, yeah, the hot flashes, right? We kind of laugh at these things. But they are painful transitions. And here's that transition word again that we were talking Mm. about, right? Um, And they also come with varying levels of social reward. And so, you know, when a girl gets breast for the first time, um, you know, she's seen as a more like sexy or celebrated or gets boy attention. And so that can have some reward to it. Um, And same with these other, you know, transitions that having a belly, being pregnant can come with some social reward. Um, Probably menopause less so. A lot of times um, women seen as like matronly or old. And so I think it's, um, you know, helpful to really just honor what that experience is, right? The good and bad parts of any of those transitions. And so for this, this question, I would say like, yeah, there's a part of that transition that's really painful and it doesn't always feel good. And it's okay to say that. Um, there's a part that feels really secure that like, oh, my body is doing what it's supposed to do. And this is part of being a woman. Um, but then other parts that it's okay to say, this doesn't feel great. Um, I think again, back to that body respect piece though, like, okay, during this transition, what does my body need from me right now? How can I create, um, comfort or safety or how can I make it feel safe to make this transition? Um, does it need cooler clothes? Does it need more water today? Does it need a different kind of movement? Um, you know, those kinds of questions that we're really taking care of ourselves. But yeah, the, that pressure of like, oh, I'm supposed to feel great about this. Like that doesn't help anybody for sure. I, yeah. my thing with the, the menopause or the perimenopause thing is like, I feel like it's just going to the place of like, I'm moving to a, like I'm getting older and Mm. like, I can't have babies anymore and all those things. And that like, I don't know, that doesn't feel great to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my response to that would be to challenge what we're taught as women. Like, what does it mean to get older and why does it have to mean that we're not you know, sexy and that we're matronly or that like, oh, well, you're kind of done your past time because mm-hmm, you can't have mm-hmm. babies, right? Like, why doesn't it mean that we're mature or powerful or wise or, you know, almost like rewriting that narrative for ourselves that it can mean positive things. Um, but at the same time, it's okay to grieve like, oh, I really loved this body that created my family and my boys and, mm-hmm. you know, or for me, my boys and my daughter mm-hmm. and um, that it's okay to grieve that too. Yeah. Okay. That's so good. I love that rewriting how, how we talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, one more question from the Facebook group. I'm sorry, everybody. We don't have time to get to all of them. Uh, <laughs> but this is actually, this is from a male listener and he is a high school coach. He coaches track and cross country. Mm. And he says he has a lot of tough conversations with his kids and parents every year. And I imagine in the world of running gymnastics, dance, lots of sports, tennis. Um, there's, it's really prevalent to have an eating disorder. And so, um, I think that can be really challenging as a coach too. Cause like, what are they being told at home, you know? And then mm-hmm. like how much, how much a voice of a voice can you have there? So I'm curious how you would, um, guide this coach. I'm glad that you're asking that. Um, and for this listener, so a couple of thoughts come to mind. Um, one is, I think that it's really important to send the message that a kid's health and well-being is more important, is more of a priority than their achievement. And so that's often what I hear anyway in my work is like, oh, well, if I restrict my food or if I lose just a little bit of weight, then I'll be faster or then I'll be, you know, whatever sport they're in. Um, I think running is a big one for sure, mm-hmm. um, where it's like, oh, this is this is a way that I can achieve. And so to really challenge that body objectification and say, actually, 
you know, you, first and foremost, your body needs to be cared for and nourished and um, really breaking down that stigma that um, is it really that a smaller body is going to be faster or is it really, is it that a body that's the most cared for is going to be able to um, perform in the way that it, it is able, right? And so really challenging the beliefs around that. Um, I think there's a couple things. I think, um, you know, I think coaches have a ton of influence. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, I think it's good that they want to um, affect their athletes in a positive way. There's a lot of resources out there. So I'd say don't expect yourself to be the expert on how to manage those conversations. Um, one thought is um, there's an eating disorder facility called McCallum Place, and it's in St. Louis, and it actually specializes in working with athletes. It's one of the very few eating disorder facilities that actually has a strength and conditioning coach on their staff, which mm -hmm. I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, but they have something called the Victory Program, and they host like free seminars for coaches and teachers and stuff like that all the time of like, Hey, here's how to have those conversations. Um, here's, here's what you can do with your influence. Here's how you can make sure that your athletes are healthy. Um, and, and, you know, maybe even have hard lines about it that, Hey, if you're not eating well, if you're not nourishing your body, if you're not, you know, taking care of yourself, protecting your sleep, um, staying hydrated that like, no, you're not going to be allowed to participate if you're not doing those basic things. And so it's kind of a, a maybe a provocative way of looking at it. But I really do think kids need to hear that, that it's not all about the achievement that, hey, you have to take care of yourself first and foremost. But gosh, I mean, I think the underlying kind of subtext of that is like, being a parent in the sport world is mm. hard at times too. Right. And like, I find myself, I mean, my boys play travel, like competitive basketball and I get so anxious sitting there like, Oh my gosh, I want them to do well. Yeah. But then I have to keep perspective <laughs> of like big picture, Katie, right. Yeah. It's, it's okay. And so to, to keep that perspective of not, you know, not thinking that, that, their time is the end all be all or whatever. So yeah, yeah, that is so hard. It's, it's so exciting to get competitive with your kids and be excited for them when they win or, you know, perform well. Uh, my son's soccer team, they just, they won all their games this season and last season they lost every single game. So like oh they gosh. made such progress and then they lost the very last game. So they were undefeated oh. all season. And, um, I felt this like really strong disappointment at first and I was like, okay, reframe your thought right now, first of all. But then second of all, my son was in tears and I was like, oh. you know, like this is a healthy dose of like what it means to compete. And it's really, it's really good for him to, to lose a soccer game, you know? Yes, yes, yes. But you sure. do get and so invested. <laughs> oh my gosh. Isn't it crazy how that happens? I know like our whole, like my emotions feel like just hijacked, but you're a hundred percent right that like, okay, as much as we want them to celebrate those wins, like, yeah, it's, it's not a bad thing to learn how to handle disappointments as well. Yeah. Um, last point on what you were just talking about. I just think that th this other comment on the Facebook group just really, um, piggybacks off what you were saying. And this woman struggles with, um, convincing herself to eat enough when she does long runs logically she knows it will help her performance but how can I begin to put aside body image for performance and I feel like I kind of mm. feel like you really just answered her question with talking about the coach and the kids yeah for sure I mean the biggest piece is we really have to, we really talk about challenging people not to be chain to an outcome of body appearance, right? And to really focus on behaviors. And so, hey, um, give it recreation, give it pleasure, give it fun, give it connection, right? And um, really focus on the behaviors rather than some outcome. Um, yeah. And the, the second we start to engage in something like running just to achieve a desired appearance or aesthetic look, we kind of rob ourselves of all the joys that running offers mm. in and of itself, right? If we only do it to look a certain way, then we miss out on all the other goodness there. And so, um, yeah, it's worth, it's worth really holding ourselves to that. Wow. That's beautiful. Okay. We're going to have to record another episode because there's yeah. just too much to cover, <laughs> but let's wrap up with end of podcast here. Okay. What is something professionally or personally you would like to do that you haven't done yet? 
Oh my gosh. So this is so funny. I would love to write a book at mm. some point in my career. Um, when my kids ask me like, mom, what did you want to be when you were young um, professionally? I wanted to be a children's book author and illustrator. So at some point I would love to write a book. I know that it's not as glamorous as it sounds, but um, that would be really satisfying for me for sure. So we'll see maybe someday. Yeah. What's, where's a trip or a place you've visited with your family, with your kids that you would recommend people go do? Oh my gosh. This is like, um, classic Ohio answer, but (laughs) our, our family goes to Hilton Head Island every year. Um, my parents have a condo there and it's such a family friendly place. Um, the reason I say is, is down there, they say, you know, where are you from? And if you say Ohio, they go, Oh, what color is your minivan? And it's <laughs> so common because it's like a 12 hour drive. So, um, yeah, we love Hilton head for sure. It's a special place for our family and really fun. Love it. Okay. What's a, what's the best, most re- recent book you've read? Oh my gosh. So, um, on spring break, I read a book called group okay. by an author named Christine Tate. So this is a little inside to me. I I'm a therapist and of course, like even my pleasure reading has to do with therapy. So <laughs> it's the story of a, of a young girl who lives in the city of Chicago and she is sort of self-destructing in her life. And a lot of her romantic romantic relationships are, are going wrong. And so she goes to group therapy and it's sort of the story of what she encounters there and how it changes her life. So it was really entertaining. If anything, there are a few things the therapist in the book does that I'm like, oh, that's oh. a little epic ethically questionable, but Uh um, really good for sure. I enjoyed it. It's like when a doctor watches ER, it's like, wait a minute, that's not how things are supposed to go here. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I will honor that that's, you know, the author's interpretation of what the therapist did. And so maybe it went down a little differently, but it was still enjoyable um, nonetheless. Yeah. Um, Two more questions. Do you have a kid's book you recommend? Yeah. Um, I love, I don't know who the author is, but there's a lovely little kid's book that has grown up with our kids, um, called beautiful oops. Okay. And so it's yellow in its appearance and each page is sort of a common kid's mistake that they make and how to kind of make it beautiful. And so a lot of like scribbles or mistakes or like folded paper or rips or things like that. And so it's um, kind of a reframing of like, oh, actually any mistake is a, is an opportunity for something beautiful. And so it's, it's cute. Um, My kids, all three have really loved it. Yeah. Love that. Okay. What's your last message to leave with the audience, Katie? Oh my gosh. Um, I think I'll go back to that statement of like, remember when you're pursuing these things, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be the perfect parent to be effective. Um, Just be authentic and keep doing the work and keep pursuing health for you. And it will affect the health of your family. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Katie, for coming on the show. It was such a pleasure to get to know you and talk with you. You all can learn more about what Katie's doing at covaxcounseling.com. That's K-O-V-A-C-S counseling.com. Um, you can find this podcast on social media. It's Why Is Everyone Yelling? I've been having fun playing with some reels over there. You can connect with me personally on Instagram. I'm Lindsay Hine 626 Big thanks to Meggie Sexton, my assistant for this podcast, who booked Katie as this guest. Don't know that I would have connected with Katie otherwise. And so I'm super grateful that Meggie had a hand in finding her as a great guest. Meggie has been behind several of our most recent guests. So I'm super thankful for her. And thank you, Emma Benner, my other Sandy Boy Productions podcast assistant, who is just amazing. She edits all of the episodes. Thank you, Emma. If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a rating and review so that more listeners can find us. And my hope is that this show provides you with community connection and hopefully some helpful parenting tips and strategies and words of encouragement um, every single week. That's my biggest hope. Show notes are at sandyboyproductions.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there as well. Uh, Thanks for being here and we will see you next week on Why Is Everyone Yelling?